13 through 14, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's you have sent your son Jesus into the world to establish a throne of we are called to be your people, that we can worship this morning with confidence in the throne of Christ. And so, Lord, we worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Zion Free Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Chris Kumpala. Thank you uh, to those that are visiting with us this morning. I want to remind you that we are uh, rebroadcasting our services on AM 1090 KTGO, uh, and that's streamed on our YouTube channel. You can find the link on our website at zionfreelutheran.com. I uh, just want to remind you of a number of events on the calendar. Uh, the first is actually this Saturday, 6 o'clock after the parade. It is, um, what is it, the... <laughs> Tioga, is it the Magical Festival of Christmas? What is it? Whatever the Tioga Festival is, um, if you can sing and carry a tune, six o'clock after the parade, we'll gather on the empty lot south of the post office to sing carols. Um, we will have carol books. Um, we're not going to make you sing without words. We're not going to make you sing without notes. Uh, and it's just, if we're going to do it, let's do it well. Uh, and so Karen Vetch had asked um, if we could lead that, and so appreciate those that can come and sing. Again, that'll be after the parade about six o'clock. Um, as we gather there. The women's Christmas tea is already a week away, uh, and if you're pl not planning on coming, change your plans and, and come, unless you're one of the guys, you are not welcome, uh, unless you're there to sweep up afterwards. Um, this is gonna be a wonderful time for a program and some music. Cider starts at seven, uh, 6.30, the program starts at seven o'clock, so do make your way at 6.30 as you're able to hang out uh, and enjoy that time. There are Vespers uh, on the 6th of December, so that won't be this week, only the first and third Wednesday, so we won't have them this week for the youth. 
Uh, looking a little bit later in the month, I want to draw your attention to the 20th of December. We've got our, our Vespers open to the whole family. And so this is a time for you, whether you've got kids or not, to show up and to worship together this Christmas season together as a family and indeed as a family of Christ. And so encourage all of you to come for that. That'll start um, at 6 o'clock uh, and encourage you to come, especially families. This is a great time to come and worship alongside your youth, and want to thank everyone that's been involved, especially our youth board, for their involvement that way with our Vespers program. Parents with Sunday school children, uh, you want to mark the ninth on your calendar. That is the Christmas program practice, 10 o'clock. Uh, that's also when the ladies will be assembling cookie platters. So please put that on your calendar for uh, Sat Saturday, the 9th of December, 10 o'clock, and the Sunday school program will be part of our morning worship service um, on the 10th. Hebrews will be back on December 17th, and for Christmas Eve, there's been a couple questions about the way the services are going to work. We're going to, wor we're going to worship Sunday morning, like we would ordinarily do, at 10.30, and then we'll have our candle lighting service uh, at 5 o'clock in the evening. Uh, and so you can come to both of those. They will be very different. Again, we'll worship in the morning, and we'll have our Christmas Eve service in the evening. I don't think there's any surprises in the way of that. Um, for those that are staying around for helping decorate for Christmas, thank you. Uh, a lot of decorations to get out and move. There is pizza ordered for those who help. So if, if you're a lazy bum, get out. <laughs> but if you're going to help Kareen and Tim with getting uh, decorations out, uh, please stick around for pizza. We are totally willing and on board with bribing you to do so. It went well last year uh, having so many hands to help. I hope that's the case for afterwards today as well. Anything that I've missed in the way of announcements that we need to cover? You can tell Barb's gone, can't you? <laughs> All right. Uh, and with that, let's go before the Lord in a time of prayer. Are there any prayer concerns we need to raise? Um, I know um, uh, we need to pray for Nicole Jorstead. Um, Nicole and Kay, where are you? Had... Um, they're dealing with a complicated birth, and they found out a couple days ago that there was brain damage, and so there's just a lot that they're dealing with as a family. And so we want to think of the Jorstead family uh, for Jamie and Nicole and their whole family and pray for that this morning. I want to continue to pray for Liam Bugby, who is much improved. He's at the hospital in Fargo, and we're grateful for the progress there's been with his health um, that way. Anything else this morning? Yeah. Brent in Uganda. Jerome Joyce, this cancer. Yep. Let's go before the Lord together. Gracious God, we thank you that we can gather, that we can worship, and that we can pray. And Lord, we thank you for this specialness of being able to draw together as a body of Christ, uplifting many things to you. Lord, we first come to you in prayers of praise, thanking you for the many blessings we enjoy as a church family, the many blessings we enjoy in this country, the peace that we enjoy. We pray for places with much less peace, whether it be in the Middle East, thinking especially with Israel or in Eastern Europe with Ukraine, other places, Lord, how we ought to be appreciative for the gift of peace. And yet, Lord, the only perfect peace comes from you. And Lord, I pray that that peace would transcend our circumstances, that it would transcend our situation. Lord, as we're drawn close to you, that we'd experience the fruit of the Spirit, peace that runs deeper than anything we know. Lord, I pray for that peace for the Jorstead family, uh, doubtless for Jamie and Nicole today, it's going to take that supernatural peace to be able to breathe, working through just the adjustments and expectations. Lord, uh, the brain damage that there is, we, we just pray that you would be gracious in working through the hands of physicians, that there would be wisdom through them. Lord, that there would be a, a gracious hand of healing. Lord, that you would sustain that child. Lord, that they would be well prepared for whatever it is that lays ahead. Lord, indeed, that your peace would be made known in their life. Pray the same for, for a Jerome Joyce, Lord. I know this cancer, um, difficult as it is to fight, and Lord, the lack of control that comes with it. Lord, you're the great physician. 
Lord, we pray that you'd tend with healing hands. Lord, that you'd come into that situation. Lord, that Jerome would be able to trust that you're right there with him. Lord, that you'd take him by the hand. Lord, that through this suffering, he would draw close to you. Lord, we pray for Liam. We thank you for sparing him uh, through dire circumstances this last week. Lord, that he is recovering. Lord, that um, he can just grow <laughs> as a baby. And Lord, we pray that there would be much less drama on the way of his recovery in the NICU. I pray for Natalie's daughter, Cheyenne, as she figures out how to be mom. Just, Lord, for all the aspects of that situation that you tend to it. Lord, that you continue to give uh, Natalie and Curtis strength and wisdom to be grandma and grandpa and using that vocation well in uh, uh, just being a presence in Liam's life. Lord, we pray for Brent and Emily Ron. And Lord, we look forward to their return to the United States. We pray that they would come, and Lord, that they would come safely. Lord, I pray that there would be uh, answers for them as they continue to work through this messed up visa process that there is. Lord, we pray that you would make a way for them to stay. Lord, that there would be clarity of that soon. But Lord, that all the more they would rest in that peace, that your will will be done. Lord, we pray that your will would be gracious, that you'd be gentle with them. And Lord, that there would indeed be answers that come in the days ahead. Lord, we thank you with whatever uncertainty we face as we come into the household of God, that we can cling to the certainty of Christ the certainty of a promise wrought by a baby, the certainty of that perfect child given in death so ours could be life. And so, Lord, I pray that we would indeed worship these weeks with a heart of Christmas, with a heart of the joy of knowing Jesus. And, Lord, that we can rejoice knowing that that same Jesus hears us now as we pray in his name. Amen. As we continue in worship today, uh, we remember that we are indeed sinners and that apart from the grace of Jesus Christ, we look to God as a righteous judge. This is the choice we face in life. Uh, God is either our gentle, merciful redeemer or he is a righteous judge. And we're reminded of this in scripture. Matthew 25, 31, it says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, when he will sit on his glorious throne, he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Jesus is that righteous God that there is a day that comes when the sheep are separated from the goats. That those that are in Christ get to be brought, shepherded into the fold of eternity with him or we're left without. Let's confess our sin in light of this scripture passage together. God, our almighty Father, you are the righteous judge who defines what is good and just in your universe. We can trust you and your word over our own sense of justice. Your patience for us staggers imagination. Our grumblings, accusations, and transgressions against you are numerous. We confess that we serve from selfish motives, expecting that you owe us for our service. Forgive us for judging who is deserving when we deserve little. Thank you for Jesus, upon whom you poured the just anger we deserved. Where we failed to endure, Jesus endured it. He lived perfectly, and our judge was to, in our place, Bring us to repentance and remembrance of Christ's unbelievable love and patience for us. Forgive us and fill us with a desire to worship him upon his throne and to serve him with a willing spirit. Amen. Acts 10, 42 says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. 
And so for any and all who look to the righteous judge confessing their sin, this judge is indeed your savior who takes upon himself the sin of the world and dies so that your sin could die with him and forgiveness of sins and life could be yours by faith today. Amen. We're going to stand as we sing together again, my heart is filled with thankfulness. And every time we receive the grace of Jesus Christ, this is the right response of worship is thankfulness, thanksgiving, praise. And so we sing unto him in thanksgiving for the gift of Jesus. thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of life that is found in him alone. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come, we come confessing the gift of the gospel that we've received in Jesus in the words of this historic creed that recounts the works of God, the works for which we give great gratitude unto him. Let's confess our common faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
I'll call the ushers forward as we receive our offering today. We thank you today, Lord, for the gift of Jesus. I pray that this would be a season of thanksgiving as we come upon Christmas time. Lord, I thank you for the many blessings that are afforded to us. Thank you for the many that were able to be with their families. Lord, I pray that we would uh, just rejoice in those blessings that you give us, those, those intangible blessings of the relationships that you have placed in and around us. Lord, I pray that uh, we would be grateful for the way that you provide for us. And Lord, that it would be a heart of thankfulness that in which we receive the blessing of, of giving unto you. Lord, I pray that both the gift and the giver would be blessed as we give in the spirit of generosity only you can give. Lord, bless these gifts for the purpose of your invisible kingdom. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
this Thanksgiving season, I was reflecting on uh, just the gratitude there is for... Oh, what happened to that now? Well, we got more than one thing going on, don't we? <laughs> I'm, I'm very thankful to everyone who serves in our music ministry, especially our accompanists. Thankful for uh, a lot of work that happens in the sound in the live stream booth. Would you just do me the kind favor of standing and giving a round of applause for all of our musicians that serve Sunday morning and for everyone that serves in that booth? We do that. I'm acutely aware of what it's like to not have those people serving next to you. And it's something that we can often take. <laughs> we are running out of things, aren't we? All right, we'll see what happens next. There's always a new adventure back there. Things get swapped around. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. You know, ministry is something that isn't meant to be done alone. That's certainly true as a scriptural truth as well. Uh, the church isn't any one person, but Christ. And that one person being Christ, we who are many are made one in him. And, and so the venture of being the church is a corporate reality. And we see this truth in uh, the letter to the Corinthians from Paul, where we have different parts of that body, all serving different functions and yet serving together as a body. And if everyone were a hand or a foot, things would look pretty demented. And let's be honest, the church looks like a gracious version of Frankenstein anyway, right? Uh, corporately, that's what it is. Sometimes we have too many feet, so we dance more. Sometimes we don't have enough hands, so we don't clap or raise our hands in church. We are a body of... Thank you, Sarah, for the courtesy laugh. We are a body of Christ that shares together, and we share together in mission. And the mission ultimately is seeking the harvest. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38, we see Jesus use this metaphor of a field ripe for the harvest as a picture of what it is that we as the body of Christ are called to do. Not as something that's optional, but as a necessary outgrowth of our reality of being in Christ, being one in Christ together. And this year I'm proud of myself because I've waited till after the farmers are all done with their business so that hopefully I could get a few of them actually to be here. We're grateful for the bounty of the table. We come around Thanksgiving and there's lots of good things to eat. And if you're a farmer or if you grew up around farming people or you do the cattle ranching, whatever it might be, there's just a little bit of a deeper appreciation of the trail of work that follows that. The picture of harvest is a picture of the trail of work that follows the grain, the, the day of harvest. In, in Revelation, we see this picture of the day when the storehouse of God is filled with ears of grain, not grain, but filled with precious eternal human souls brought into paradise with God. There's no question what it is that Jesus is speaking to. And we'll see it very clearly as we get into the text together. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, we read in Jesus' name. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Heavenly Father, these are your words. And Lord, as we come to this text today, Lord, how I pray that our hearts would uh, be moved by your word to be concerned for missional life as Christians, not just concerned for our own spiritual well-being tucked away in the warmth away from the winter of spiritual confusion and spiritual death. Lord, I pray that our concern would not just to be in the abode of comfort, but Lord, that we would be moved by this text to move past comfort 
to share in the commission that you have given us. Lord, we thank you that as we're here today, we are all, each of us, blessed by the ministry of others, whether they're clergy or not. And Lord, I pray that this text then would move us to affect your mission through our life. Lord, that would be your word that does that work for your word alone is everlasting truth from cover to cover. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This text speaks of a plentiful harvest. It's a, a beautiful thing to await. It's the day uh, that has been foretold all through the Old Testament as well. We see allusions to this in the Old Testament, the promise of harvest day coming. And, and the idea is attached to the promise of blessing, the promise of land, the promise of being in the promised land of God. It is a promise to uh, be counted as being next to God all over again, working in the garden. Our natural vocation, think of it, is to tend to the garden. Our natural vocation in some sense is to be farmers, to tend to things that live. In fact, it is a sense in which the commission starts as created beings to be fruitful and multiply, to have dominion over the earth. It is one of the purest analogies that Jesus uses and one universally understood through all time. There have always been farmers, there will always be farmers, even if they end up farming the planet Mars or something like that. This plentiful harvest is something we need to understand. We're going to work through this text together quickly, and then we'll, we'll dig into some things together. In verse 35, what we see is Jesus going out teaching in all the villages and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So his ministry is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is doing. The context is him going teaching. He is preaching. So he, you see him teaching with his disciples. So you see him proclaiming to these groups of people the, the, the truth that he is the Messiah and that good news is coming. And he's healing as a sign that authenticates the validity of that message. That Jesus is who he says that he is. And so as he goes out healing every disease and affliction, he sees these crowds and he's moved to compassion for them. He is concerned for the well-being of those that he encounters. He is concerned for the well-being of you today. No question about it. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, when we're in the place of safety, it's easy for us to be unconcerned for places of danger. It's easy for us to watch television news about some place that's in danger and say, oh, shucks, boy, that looks like an awful situation to be in. Too bad. Move on with our life without ever giving it a second thought. But as human beings created in the image of God, we can't help but be moved to compassion. And as Christians who recognize that these are creatures of God that he would have with him in eternity, not snuffed out early by acts of senseless violence, we are moved to compassion like Jesus was. He had compassion for them because they were not shepherded. And this is a spiritual dimension, and we'll come to that. Verse 37, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But what's the problem? What if you're a farmer and suddenly you've added 5,000 acres and you didn't plan for it? <laughs> you're going to be short on tractors, you're going to be short on equipment, you're going to be short on people. And here we have a situation where the harvest is plentiful and it creates and it's, in fact exasperates a problem which is too few laborers. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God calls us to pray for the Lord to send out laborers to meet the need that is in the harvest. And so this text begs us to ask this question, what is the Lord of the harvest telling us about this plentiful harvest? What is it that Jesus is saying about how it is that the Lord of the harvest is going to reach and bring in this harvest of precious eternal human souls in him? And before I move on, Eli, should we move to the pulpit, Mike? Would that be more helpful? Okay, all right, you carry on. You need to do something, throw a shoe at me or something, okay? As we come to the, to the, the first uh, verse, in verse 35, we see that the Lord of the harvest calls it to participate 
in the ministry of proclaiming the gospel with and without words. Verse 35, it says, Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. This primary, primary ministry of Jesus, which was to proclaim the good news, was the thing that Jesus was about. As he went uh, by the, the countryside and he preached, it was the primary thing that Jesus was doing. And so as he calls for laborers in the vineyard, laborers in the field, there's no question that it's meant to mirror what Jesus is just doing in the context. What is it that these laborers are going to be doing? Jesus stuff. They're going to be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ that salvation is found in him alone. In Matthew 13, verse 18 through 23, we have the parable of the sower. There's an explanation of the parable of the sower and the good soil of those who receive the word in faith. There's seed that's scattered, and in some places it lies on good ground and indeed takes root. In verse 19 of Matthew 6, it says, Do not lay up uh, treasures for yourselves. Uh, I'm in the wrong place here. (laughs) I got so many Bible texts in front of me here. Matthew 13, 18 through 23, it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Verse 20 is, for what was sown on rocky ground, this one hears the word immediately, receives it with joy, but it has no root in himself, but endures for a while when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what is sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfaithful. As for what was sown on good soil, This is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and another 30. So we have this picture of the word of God growing. And it grows from roots to leaves to fruit. There is a reproductive dimension of the power of God's word. That as it works in our life, there is a fruit that is expressed in our love of God, in our holiness, in our walk with him, but also in our love of neighbor and our service to others in proclaiming the gospel with and without words. Our mission statement as a church is to show the love of Jesus through what we teach and do, through our witness of works, but ultimately and especially through the proclamation of the gospel in Jesus Christ. This is the work, and it's... 100% necessary to the church. It has to happen. There is no church without this happening. There are no disciples without this happening. There are no disciples that, that receive the gospel and bear fruit and become the leaders of the New Testament church without this. This is a necessary dynamic from the beginning of the church starting with Jesus and three disciples, then 12 disciples, and 72, then this whole host to the millions of Christians that endure today. It's hard work. (laughs) <laughs> and as a pastor, I can attest to that. And one of my goals today is to talk about the nature of that work and thinking specifically, because we've got to be realistic about where this work is going and what this work looks like and the challenges that we face as a congregation, as a church body, and across our country. In the United States, less than 16% of pastors are less than 40 years old. Think about that. So pastors that can call themselves less than 40, that would be us 35-year-olds, and younger. The only 16% can count themselves as younger than 40. The average age is 52. It was 44 30 years ago. And one in four pastors are going to retire before 2030, which is how far away? Let's call it six years, right? We're almost on 2024. Six years out, we're going to lose another 25% of pastors. And the thing is, is that if you, if you have strayed from God's word and you're out on some strange wing, out on a out on a far branch, away from God's word, the statistics are, are even worse. The challenge is for churches across the board, but if you're a church in name only and not confessing truly what scripture says, your position is even worse than this. The Lord of the harvest calls us to participate in the work of ministry because it is necessary. There are not enough pastors to do the work of even pastoring. Pastoring is not the entirety of the work that happens in a congregation. It definitely isn't the entirety of the work that happens here at Zion. 
But even if we're talking about the work of pastoring, we are running short. Now, our church body is doing much better than others, but there's no question that there are challenges ahead. And we will have churches close over the next 20 years, at least in part because there just aren't enough pastors. That's the world we live in. We're coming off of this high time of, of predominant uh, cultural Christian winds where, where you could just, I mean, church was a matter of opening the doors and people would show up for Sunday morning, you got a church. That was it. <laughs> it was easy. It was like a chia pet. Just spread it, water it, grow, you're done. <laughs> Things have changed. They've changed intensely. And the participation in ministry isn't just for us men of the cloth. It is indeed for us as a whole church. As Jesus speaks of the harvest, he's speaking to disciples. He's speaking to everyone. He's speaking to this whole group, preparing them for the work in the field. The Lord of the harvest has a heart of compassion, doesn't he? He move our, moves our hearts to compassion for the lost and the way where Jesus, as he goes about, this is where we see Jesus pulling away and resting a while, going and praying, pulling away to spend time because he's exha- exhausted, not just meeting the teaching needs, but he's there helping with the physical afflictions of these people, dealing with the practical need of these people that he happens upon, that come and chase after him. He comes to this group of people, and in verse 36, it says that he was moved to compassion. When he saw them, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, 4 through 6, it talks about bad priests, bad ministers, who allow the sheep to be scattered to and fro. No feeding, no direction, no work of God's word in either sustaining through the power of God's grace and gospel our spiritual life, and no correction where it is that we live apart from God's will in rebellion to him. None of that. And so you have priests in name only, and Ezekiel comes and says, you guys aren't shepherds at all. You can't keep track of any of these sheep. You don't even know which ones are yours. In Luke 10, in Luke 10 verses 2 through 3, Luke adds this context that lambs are in the midst of the wolves. He warns of the reality of shepherding in a world with people who are not just neutral about spiritual things, but indeed hostile to the purpose of God's kingdom. Luke 10, verse 2, he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then he says this, Luke 10, verse 3, go your way, behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. It's risky business shepherding sheep if there's little meat eaters running around. Because guess what? You might taste good too. Shepherding is a dangerous job. And and, and Luke elaborates on this to to remind us that he reminded his disciples that shepherding is a dangerous job. And you're not doing the job right if you're not putting yourself in danger. You don't get credit if you just take care of the sheep that haven't wandered off. If you're not pursuing those that are lost, you're not doing the job of a shepherd. Indeed, those in Ezekiel's time certainly were not. In Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16, there's a parable of the vineyard that shows that laboring in God's kingdom is a privilege undertaken in love, not a pursuit of our own personal reward and status here on earth. We see this this picture in in, uh, uh, verse 3. Going out the third hour, he saw some standing idle in the marketplace, said to them, you go into the vineyard too, whatever is right I will give you, and payday comes. You have some who've been out the whole day. You have some that have only come for a few hours. And the ones who've been out the whole day, they're resentful of God, these latecomers. We can be in danger of resenting latecomers to the Christian faith. We can be resentful of those who have come to a saving faith late in life. People who showed up late to the party to work. Maybe you're one who served faithfully for years and you struggle with those who have opportunity to serve and don't. And then they finally do and it's just, it, it can be hard in our spirit. But we are moved by the compassion of Christ. It is what must motivate us in ministry because ministry is hard and ministry is dangerous. And this is a most recent research. Things have changed. The amount of things that have changed in the last five years and the last 10 years 
culturally in the way that it affects ministry is staggering. The way that I could pastor 10 years ago no longer exists. Pastoral satisfaction dropped and defining that uh, <laughs> pastoral satisfaction was what they called it. Uh, are you satisfied in your ministry? It dropped from 72% in 2015 to 52% in 2022. That steep a drop. Confidence in their call dropped from 65% to 35%, almost cut in half. And in and 24% considered quitting in 2015, 51% considered quitting in 2022. You have twice the number of pastors that are considering quitting as we're already facing pastoral shortage. And what all these numbers are telling us is that things have changed in the culture and who knew the work of the harvest is hard and not to be undertaken alone. And as we Think about what kind of laborers he's talking about. Again, he's talking about laborers who are doing the Jesus stuff, the preaching of the word. We are talking about raising up pastors. This church, the impact of this church, is not just what happens in the border of the Tioga community with those that are here, but it happens with Brent and Emily way off in far off Uganda. Or, or with Brent Olson on the seminary campus training up all the pastors, including me, teaching Old Testament on our seminary campus. These people that are, are, are called up and out of the congregation, equipped to the task of serving, make a big impact. Matt Renitz planting a church in the middle of pagan Seattle. Part of the mission of the church is not just to serve the borders of our own sheep pen, but to raise up new shepherds to go and serve other flocks because the concern is for the global flock, the global sheep. As much as things have changed, as much as we look with frustration on cultural changes about how different ministry looks, we nonetheless recognize that even in my generation and those younger, there is a desire for Jesus. Maybe not a desire for, for the religious trappings of the church, but they want Jesus. And there's an extent to which <laughs> there's a problem in that with, you know, <laughs> Jesus doesn't really give you a choice. I mean, it's like, you know, you're going to be in Jesus. You're going to do it together. You're going to be brought together in the church. That's the design of the thing. And there's a problem there. But nonetheless, think about this. We think about Gen Z. Uh, anyone Gen Z want to put their hand up so we recognize who we're talking about? That I'm not Gen Z, right? So younger than me, younger than me. So we're talking uh, kids that are basically in high school right now, right? And younger, until we get to Generation Alpha, which is uh, you littles, okay? 26% watch a TV show or movie about Jesus. 24% listen to a Christian podcast. 58% identify as Christians, uh, and that's not correct. This is actually 48% uh, have a biblical worldview, world not 48, not 4%, 48%. I'm encouraged by that. Are you encouraged by that? Who's encouraged by that number? Uh, that's, a, that's a better number than you would expect, isn't it? Especially when we like to groan about younger generations and all oh, those millennials. And by the way, hello, I am a millennial. <laughs> we have kids. Our millennials have grandkids. We have moved far along. And look how different their experience is in encountering Jesus. We're not even measuring the kinds, the, 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 the kinds of things we were for years ago, a few years ago. Watching a TV show, listening to a Christian podcast, our age of social media. People want Jesus. The young people that are there, that are wanting Jesus, they're there. They want to know him. They want to be in God's word. They just want to do it in terms that doesn't necessitate this choice between preserving an ideal version of the 1960s and discipling faithfully in Jesus. Jesus. And, and that's a crass way to put it, but it's true. The number of equipped, passionate leaders that Beck and I know that are in our age group, that it's not even an issue of not being in an AFLC church, they're not in a church because they're frustrated with not being able to move on with the mission of the church. You have no idea how fortunate and blessed we are as Zion to have the leadership that we do, to have the servants that we do, that there is the movement that there has been, that there is the faithful teaching and shepherding of this 
sheep, of this sheepfold that now I get to enjoy coming in. Johnny, come lately. <laughs> Churches are closing their doors. Churches are failing to reach the youngest generation, and indeed, as has always been the case, Christianity stands one generation away from being snuffed out. But the harvest is plentiful. The problem is the laborers are few. I'm going to call the kids up at this time. Come on up, kids. I got to sugar you up. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead. Take a seat. Take a seat. Okay. Teddy, are you here? Where's Teddy? Oh, hi, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to stand back here. Okay, Teddy, I'm going to have you volunteer. Come on, on your feet. Come on, on your feet. Come on. Okay. Everyone else, sit down. Sit down. I'm going to do this to my own son so I don't get criticized by parents. Come over here, over here, stand over here. Okay, Alex, yes, you can help him. Okay, ready? Ready? Here we go. All right, ready? I'm going to make a mess. Okay, I'm going to make a mess. Okay, can you pick those up? Go ahead and pick them up. Pick them up. Now, okay, do you guys have siblings that make a mess? How often do you clean up your siblings' mess? Does anyone do that? You'd, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know. Like, yeah, a lot of attitude. Yeah, mm-hmm, tell me about it, right? And the thing is, well, we've got a big mess. And cleaning up candy is probably a lot more fun than cleaning up other things, right? Um, when there's lots of work to be done, when there's lots of cleaning that happens, what is it that you want to do? What do you want to do? Watch TV. Thank you. Thank you for the honest answer. I'm with you. I'm with you. I want to watch. I want to binge watch another Netflix series. I want to watch TV. I don't want to participate in picking up. Thank you, Teddy and Alex, for cleaning that up. High five. Thank you. Thank you. All right. How often does it happen that when we make a mess, right, or that someone else has made a mess, that sometimes we don't want to roll up our sleeves and kind of get involved? Does that happen? Does it happen to you guys? Yes, it does. So we were at Maverick's birthday party last night. I was going to bring the uh, confetti guns, but I didn't want to make Ronnie upset. <laughs> it would have been awful. The static electricity makes it stick to everything, Ronnie. And I told Evelyn to go ahead, shoot yours in the kitchen. And what happened? What do you suppose happened? The little confetti gun. What happened? It made a mess. And what did Auntie Gracia have to do? She had to clean up. She was out there with a broom. And the problem with the broom is that it makes more static electricity, which makes it stick worse. And I'm sitting there, right? And do you think I want to help? No, I don't want to. I was able to give some good advice on a better way for her to do it, vacuuming, right? <laughs> We're all about advice. You know, when Jesus talks about going out and working in a field, how many have actually gone out and worked in a field? Pulling weeds or maybe working a farm, helping work a farm, doing some landscaping work? Anyone done any of that? Yep. Yep. What, do you like that work? No. Why is that, honey? Sometimes it's fun. I agree. You know, there's things, and there's something about that. Even pulling weeds can be satisfying. And I've appreciated that a lot. I think both in Becca's family and my family, we've learned some of the simple satisfaction of pulling weeds because what happens if you don't pull the weeds? What's that? They grow bigger. And suddenly, you don't have a nice lawn. You've just got a big patch of weeds. Uh, right, they suck up water for the other plants. Yeah, and so what, what God wants to see, he wants to see a really nice harvest, right? God wants to see, what's that? Doesn't want us to pick the trees, yeah, yep. God is concerned about this harvest that's out there, and does, you know, could God bring in the whole harvest himself? If God created the, all the wheat in the world, do you think he could harvest it on his own? You think so? I think so. I think God could. But what does God want to do with you? What does God want to do with all of us? He wants us to clean up. He wants us to go out and be part of the harvest because you know what we find out when we're out there and we're doing the work, you farmer's kids? There's a lot of fulfillment in it, isn't there? There's a lot of fulfillment in putting that work in and seeing the grain bins get filled up, the trucks haul away, and knowing that we contributed something that really mattered. Is there anything that matters more than God's kingdom? Is there anything that matters more than Jesus? Who thinks Jesus matters the most? 
Do you think it's worth working for Jesus? I think so too. Go ahead, grab some candy, guys. Thank you. You know, it's, it's always difficult to not come to this text and not come into that trap of reading it as, you know, if we don't get enough workers, God's not going to do his thing. Do you think God's going to do his thing? Those of you who have family members, friends, that are spiritually lost and wandering, do you trust that Jesus is the good shepherd? Do you trust that God will use people in surprising places, in surprising ways, to bring the gospel to people? Isn't it good to be that person? Isn't it good to be part of sharing the good news of Jesus, that we're forgiven in him? The Lord of the harvest desires that we pray for the calling, equipping, and sending of labors, that we listen to that call in our own lives. Oh, something that this church, I think, has been good at in years past, I think it's something we need to continue to be faithful in, is praying for pastors. And I gotta tell you, I, I, I gotta be honest about this. It's, it's the hardest thing to pray for as a pastor. Think of it. God, I want you to, to where it's in your will to raise up spiritually qualified people who are really gifted and send them away where they can't help me. Do you know how hard that is to pray as a pastor? God, raise up workers to go and help someone else's harvest. But we do, because it's what God commands, because it's about his harvest and about his bottom line, not ours. It's not about any church's brand, it's about the brand of the cross of Christ. In John chapter 4, verse 31. Jesus emphasizes the urgency of the missionary task of working in the harvest. In verse 32, Jesus says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then come the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. It's a shared venture. And what matters is it doesn't matter, right? I mean, and, and this is how it works for farming out here, right? I mean, if someone's way behind, you're liable to help them. When someone gets in an anhydrous accident and they're running way short of being able to deal with their harvest, you better believe people are going to show up with their tractors and equipment to try to help them out. Get caught up. Because there's perfectly good food sitting, in, sitting out in a field that we don't want to see go to waste. The picture here, and let's all be farmers for a moment, is that there is a harvest that is getting close to past due. That there is a harvest that, should it not be brought in, will be spoiled and worthless. Farmers, Brian, I'm just going to pick on you. I've seen you. You look awful when you're tired when this time hits. You're welcome. I love you enough to be honest. You just, it's, it's a make it work thing, isn't it? You have to. And it, it doesn't, and somehow, and all you, I don't, know, I don't know how farmers farm without being Christians because it's like God, somehow, some way, this isn't making sense on paper or the napkin drawing on the steering wheel. There's work that needs to be done. It has to get done. And all the priorities in life suddenly take second place even if it comes down to Nancy bringing you SpaghettiOs because I've stolen her to play piano. <laughs> this work is urgent. It's necessary. And so we see it not just in account of statistics, we see it on account of what God has commanded us to do. 
So what we see happening is congregations prioritizing development. And this is something that I've shared with the church coming to Zion, is that churches are healthy when they're concerned about the development of their people and to spiritually mature servants using their gifts effectively in God's kingdom. And much of that is to the end of them going and blessing somebody else's church. It's not about blessing Zion. Congregations are prioritizing development because there's not enough pastors to go around. Again, pastoring isn't the only place there's an issue, but it makes it concrete. The second thing that's happening is that church bodies, like our AFLC, are prioritizing education. This is why our Free Lutheran Bible College has gone through so much change over the last five years. The school, as it started, when I started there, I started just before Wade Mobley started there, after Fran Munseth had died. When I started at the Bible College, it was the Association Free Lutheran Bible School, affectionately known, if you hear this, around the halls of Zion, Aphelbis. That is what we refer to, Aphelbis, because five words is a lot to spit out. And we ruined it by changing it to Free Lutheran Bible College. But we took a word out, so at least we can say it that way. Uh, this year marks the beginning of the school as a four-year college program. Four years, not a two-year Bible college where, okay, spend some time in God's Word, go to a college. The whole thing's been brought in house. The reason being that whether we're talking about clergy or we're talking about lay people, the need for people to work in the harvest is so great, and the work now uniquely challenging enough that we need to train them and train them well. Our AFLC is doing everything it can to marry the development of spiritually mature servants of Christ in the congregation with good foundational preparation in our educational institutions in Plymouth, Minnesota, and I'm sure someday elsewhere as well. Our seminary is a vital ministry. What Brent does uh, dealing with us seminary students, there are days when I look like Brian in harvest time, <laughs> you know, sitting in a classroom, and you wonder, is it making any difference? For all the agony of class preparation, teaching, waiting, the investment that's represented by some seminary graduate like me is immense. Just graduating seminary represents an investment of a million dollars and untold hours of faculty and others. And then some church signs up to take on interns like Stanley has done so often so that pastors can go someplace to make mistakes, to enjoy the grace of spiritually mature congregations who can absorb those mistakes and make them better as pastors to be sent out and make mistakes but hopefully less of them. This work is something we so often take for granted as a church, and yet if we weren't praying for that, if we weren't earnest in supporting it, I wouldn't be here. Brent wouldn't be in Uganda, and I know the Old Testament department would be wanting, <laughs> and there wouldn't be a church in Seattle, a place that desperately needs it, and so much more than that. We care about the harvest, about those that might come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so we were concerned for what God has to say. I'm going to leave the uh, cross-references out of this one. The Lord of the Harvest reminds us that the work in the kingdom is the only work that counts for eternity. It always um, depresses me when I feel like I've got to press that point. As, as Christians, our concern is meant to be the things that are eternal not the things that are temporal, not the things that in a flash of a, a pan can be gone. Money can be gone, your health can be gone, your success <laughs> with one mistake. The work that matters most is the work that counts for eternity. Finally, in verse 37 through 3, the Lord of the harvest promises that our toil in the congregation will bear fruit. Verse 37, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. What I appreciate so much about that passage is that it's God who sends them out. It's God who sends us out. It is God who, for whatever reason, gifts 
people with these ministry gifts with a desire to serve. Again, this is not, this is not relegated to just clergy. It is so encouraging to serve along other peop- alongside other people who serve outside of self-interest, who serve because our concern isn't about this life, but it's concerned for bringing others with us into the next. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 5 through 9, we see this wonderful um, treatment of the Corinthian church. Uh, you've got a group that really likes Apollos, a dynamic preacher, and Paul evidently was something of a stodgy bore, which um, you know, he probably could have improved in. Maybe he needed uh, more illustrations or candy. I don't know. But a lot of people liked Apollos. So Paul writes back and he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. That's it. We water, we plant, we water, but it's God who gives the growth. We go, we, we nurture, and as a pastor, as well, you, you, you cultivate, but ultimately, the call of God into the vocations, whether it's ministry, it's other places in life, that's up to God to do. And it's a wonderful thing that it's not up to us to sell people into it. This gives us great freedom. We're in the midst of a wait. Uh, we have needed a second pastor for how long would you say, Henry? Probably since Matt left. Uh, and it, we've needed one. And if we needed one then, we need it all the more now. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting in the midst of a pastoral shortage. And if our heart is to just take one off the shelf, putting it crassly, you should come to Zion. So we have two pastors. And there's, there's, pa- there's, there's churches. They've got to check their heart. They get upset at churches that have more than one pastor. What? We, we, we don't have a pastor. You're going to take up two? <laughs> and there's some things for them to deal with. But for us, if our heart isn't to raise up pastors through the faithful planting and watering of God's word in the life of the congregation, if our concern isn't the development of spiritual leaders, what right do we have to expect that God is going to bring someone else's fruitful labor to us? And yet God does it all the time. But think of that. Some stranger like me who represents only indirectly, and maybe I'm a bad example for this, (laughs) But you are talking about men that represent the spiritual investment of a congregation someplace where the members you've never met, dollars you've never contributed. My concern today is that we give thanks for the laborers that are part of our congregation, that we give thanks for the faithful pastors that there are, that the Thanks for the faithful pastors that are in our AFLC. But that we remember the harvest, that the work is urgent, and so that we'd plant, that we'd water, and that we'd let God give the growth. Actively waiting means developing our people now. It means you cultivating your gifts in serving in small ways in the church where you can and enjoying the blessing of working in God's harvest. I believe that's where God blesses. I believe that's where churches have experienced great blessing is trying to get rid, trying to get rid of leaders. Let's make more leaders than we can possibly use. Send them away someplace else. Let's go plant a church someplace. Maybe it'll be over in Kenmure, maybe down in Harvey, someplace out in the middle of nowhere outside of Ray. Who knows? But if our heart is to... <laughs> send more people out than to bring people in. I expect God will bless us. I expect God will not just bless us in the fruit, but God will bless us in uniting us in his will to seek laborers for his harvest. 
not labors for our particular agenda as a church. I pray that your heart would be for the harvest. I pray that you'd be concerned for not just having someone come in then and work for that harvest, but that we'd be concerned in working that together. And it doesn't always have to be big. <laughs> it doesn't have to be committing to being on the organ all the time, Carol Jean. <laughs> and about a dozen other things that are unseen, which I won't go into. <laughs> True of many others. Whatever small way we get a share in being part of the fruitfulness of ministry, which is seeing precious eternal human souls come to Jesus and those eternal human souls bearing the fruit that reproduces for generations, ones who'll be called into the glory of eternity with us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the many pastors who have been here in Tioga through the years. We thank you for the many faithful lay leaders that have served, whether it's been on boards or off boards. Lord, we thank you for the many servants who serve today, for those who served before. Lord, I pray that our heart would be one of service, that we'd see the need to reach precious eternal human souls for Jesus. Lord, that we'd be seriously concerned about your harvest, about your storehouse being full. And Lord, that we'd empty ours in the name of seeking Jesus. Lord, do a work in our hearts that only you can do. It's your word that works by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for that, that ours is simply to plant and water. Oh, Lord, how we pray that there'd be growth in your time and your way. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we're going to sing uh, just verse 1 and 3 of My Jesus. I love the hymn number 193. Would you stand as you're able? Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you go, go with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his holy countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
go forth and serve the Lord. Thank you for those who are sticking around to help for Christmas decorations.